happy that you're here to hang out with me and to have a small little talk about Scala. I figured, since Python isn't the only programming language used in data science and data engineering, let's have a look at Scala and make a tutorial. In this video, we will cover the basics of Scala, and if you're interested in more tutorials on Scala, I will dive deeper into specific topics in the future. With that being said, I'm not the biggest crack in terms of Scala, but in my last project at Porsche, and by the way, the correct way to pronounce it in German is Porsche. I wrote quite some data processing code using Spark and Scala, so I'm quite confident that I'm experienced enough to do this tutorial. That being said, let's dive into it. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Johannes Frey, but you can simply call me Joe, and I've been working as a software engineer for more than 15 years. And before we start, it would be super awesome if you could go completely nuts on that subscribe button and completely destroy that like button. Thank you very much. Also, please leave a comment if you would like more Scala videos in the future. I've got my laptop here, so let's get going. I've prepared a little something so that you don't have to endure me struggling to type something into the editor. The code will be shown up here and the stuff that I run will be displayed down there. The IDE that I'm using is JetBrains IntelliJ IDEA and it is super awesome and I highly recommend that you check it out. So every program needs a starting point. In Scala there are several ways to do it, but one way that I like is defining an object and extending the app trait. The name of the object does not matter, so it does not need to be named main. This ensures that everything that is defined uh, between those curly braces is executed whenever you run your program. The first thing that I want to talk about are data types. Scala has constants and variables. A variable is defined using the var keyword and a constant is defined using the val keyword. Constants are, as the name suggests, obviously are constant and therefore you are not able to reassign other values to them. As we see here, we can reassign a variable, but when we try to reassign a constant, we get an error. In Scala, it is best practice to use constants as much as possible and only use variables when absolutely necessary. Even though Scala is a statically typed language, providing a type for a constant or variable is optional. Scala is usually smart enough to figure out what data type to use for a specific constant or variable, but you can declare a type if you really want to, and there are cases in which Scala is not able to figure out the type so it's handy to know how. You provide a type by adding a colon followed by the data type after the name of the variable or constant, like so. Scala supports all the usual data types that you might already know from other programming languages like int, double, boolean, character, and string. One neat thing about strings in Scala is that they have string interpolation built in. Where you need to concatenate strings to include variables and other things in other programming languages, you can just do this in Scala. I would say it's enough for data types. Let's have a look at control structures now. Of course, you can use if, then, else with Scala. But the nice thing about that in Scala is that if statements are actually expressions. That means that they return a value. Because of that, you can also inline them. Also, you can chain multiple if expressions together if you really like to. But in my experience, you don't really need that, because there are usually better ways. And we will have a look at one such way in just a minute, right after we talked about loops. Scala has four loops, but they are actually more like four each loops in other programming languages. You provide a sequence or list, and using four, you are able to loop through its elements. Be cautious though, four loops don't return anything by default, but you are able to use four expressions to perform something like a map operation in other languages. That is, looping through a list, do something with each element, and return a list with the modified elements. You can identify four expressions by the keyword yield that is used to return the modified value. Collections in Scala also have for each and map methods to do basically the same thing as for loops and for expressions. One way is more object-oriented and the other more functional. And we talked about avoiding chained if expressions earlier. One way to do that is the match expression, and we will talk about it now. It's basically like a switch statement in other programming languages, but on very serious steroids. Let's have a look at it. So here we match whatever is in the variable or constant i. In case it has the value one, this block will be executed. In case it has the value two or three, this block gets executed. And if nothing matches, 
This is how you define a fallback. This looks nice, but you can do some more nice things. Here we define a class with two attributes and create an instance of the class using its constructor. When we now match this instance, we are able to even check for the instance's attributes and its type, for example. I hope you get the idea that match expressions are quite powerful. The next thing would be exception handling. It's actually yeah, quite straightforward with the knowledge that we have so far. Whenever an exception gets thrown inside the try block, the catch block checks for the exception's type and executes the respective code block. The last case in this example is a catch all case, where when none of the other cases matches, this one gets executed. The finally block is optional and gets executed no matter what. So when an exception occurs and also when no exception occurs. It is a good idea to put cleanup code there, like for example, closing files that you have opened before or database connections or stuff like that. Scala comes with all the usual collections, but there is a twist. Even though Scala comes with both mutable and immutable collections, the immutable collections are the default. That means when you use list, for example, you will not be able to change it after it has been created. When you append elements to it, always a new list is created. This example should illustrate what I just mentioned. You are able to prepend and append to a list, but the initial list is never changed. By the way, list is an implementation of a linked list data structure. Same holds true for set, which is an unsorted collection in which each element can only occur once at most. So there can't be any duplicates inside a set. And the map collection is your typical key value store. This is by the way how you iterate over a map. I have the feeling that this video is longer than I wanted it to be, so let's quickly talk about classes. And But before we do that, if you liked the video so far, it would be super nice if you could go completely crazy and insane on the subscribe button, the like button, and leave a comment down below. So that would be really helpful and thank you very much. So you basically define a class like that. And as you see, we can use the val and var in the definition of a class. When you declare the constructor parameters as val, then that attribute will be read only. And when you use var, you will be able to reassign values to that attribute. This example should demonstrate this. If you would like to not just define attributes in a constructor, but actually run some code during initialization, add a code block to the class definition. Whatever is in the code block will be run when new instances of the class are created. And using the keyword private, you can also define non-public attributes or properties. Defining methods is also quite straightforward and is done using the dev keyword. All those method definitions are equivalent, but some might be less verbose than others. One thing to point out is that the return type of a method is, again, optional. And there are no static methods or properties in Scala. To get something that behaves like it, though, you can use companion objects. Objects in Scala are a kind of classes that cannot be instantiated. And they can have the same name as classes so there won't be any name clashes. This way, you are able to simulate the static behavior of other programming languages. There are a lot more nice things about Scala, like case classes, more complex pattern matching, traits, functional programming, and so on and so on. So if you are interested in that, please let me know down in the comments. And throughout this tutorial, I was heavily leaning on the Scala book, which is a free online book that is available. Uh, and I put a link down in the description and I highly recommend that you check it out because it's quite good. If you liked the video and got some value out of it, going completely nuts on that subscribe button and destroying the like button would be really appreciated. So see you in the next video. Bye bye.